Um, I'm Carrie Rogers, the training coordinator here with West Virginia uh, CTSI Clinical Trials uh, Center of Excellence. Um, today is our last um, clinical trials toolkit series for the semester. It's managing um, adverse events and con, uh, I do this every time, concomitant medications in EPIC. Um, our presenter today is Yvonne Shaw. Um, she's the quality control supervisor with WVU Cancer Institute uh, with the clinical research unit. Um, I'm, I'm, some of you've heard me, but we are offering CEs today. Um, but for attendance purposes, if you'd put your name and email in the chat, if you're a WVU employee and would like CEs, if you would indicate that, that would be great. So with that, I'm going to um, go ahead and turn it over to, you, to Yvonne, okay? Thank you. Thanks, Kerry. Um, thanks everyone for joining us today. Um, appreciate you coming along. Um, I do encourage questions along the way, um, or if you prefer to wait to the end, um, Kerry is gonna monitor the chat as well. So if you would prefer to type in, that's also fine. Um, but speak up if anyone would like to do that along the way. So um, today I'm gonna to be covering just a little bit about uh, managing adverse events and con concomitant medications or ComMeds in EPIC um, and how we have come to do that through the, um, the clinical research unit, uh, moving that to a more ele electronically based system. So I don't have any disclosures. Um, I do have a disclaimer in that, the, you know, Carla and I, we can put, put together this presentation. We do work in oncology. So a lot of this is oncology based language that we have, um, but still lots of things I think and tools that could be applied to different indications. And then my other disclaimer, um, I was supposed to be in the office today, but I'm at home. So my dog uh, sometimes gets vocal. So he may join in, hopefully not, but if he does, it's, um, his name's Winston, it's quite friendly. Um, so first of all, to start, and I'm, I'm making the assumption that everyone does know what an adverse event is, um, but just have a very quick overview, you know, of what we term as an adverse event and what we collect. Um, across the different agencies, you know, government and non-governmental agencies, there isn't a common definition. So there is, you know, a definition of this in ITHGCP, um, which falls somewhat in line with the OHRP guidance. And then the FDA also has their, their language around what an adverse event is. In general terms, we're looking at something that's um, an untoward medical occurrence or, um, or event that happens to a patient that is on a clinical trial um, or involved in clinical research. Really, that's a change from baseline. So something that's different from when they started on the clinical research project. We also have the serious adverse events, which is that subset of adverse events which is listed and documented in the Code of Federal Regulations by the FDA. Um, and that's where an adverse event becomes serious because of death, if it's a life-threatening AE. Um, there's an inpatient hospitalization or a prolongation of an existing hospitalization. Um, if there's a persistence or significant incapacity or substantial disruption of the ability to conduct normal life functions, or if there's a congenital anomaly or birth defect. In addition to those, there's sometimes there might be an important medical event that in the judgment of the investigator, they see it to be um, a serious adverse event and would like to report it in that way to make sure any sponsor is aware of this medical event. Um, sometimes within our protocols, and I know, you know for us sometimes, specifically in oncology, we see, for example, inpatient hospitalization might need to be greater than 24 hours. Um, if it's less than 24 hours, then it might just be considered an adverse event. Or if it's something that was planned, for example, if we know for some of our patients that they are likely to come in because of a certain drug that they're taking, that those specific events would not be reported as an SAE because it's very expected for that patient population. So always good to refer back to the protocol and see, see what that language is. The Code of Federal Regulations also includes information about unexpected adverse events. So some of it would be considered unexpected if it's not included in the investiga investigator brochure, exactly as it's stated in that brochure. So if the specificity or the severity that is observed in the patient is different from what's in the IB, then that would be unexpected. Um, or if it's expected in a certain class that the drug belongs to, but it's not specifically mentioned for this named drug, then that also would be unexpected. If the IB, the investigator brochure is not available, then you would also refer to the general investigational plan or you know, what we typically call the protocol. Um, and if it's not included there either, then it could come under that unexpected AE um, category. 
So obviously, you know, the big thing is why do we report AEs? Why is it important that we are documenting them correctly and making sure that we are reporting them correctly? So first reason we've got is it's the law. When an investigator signs that FDA 1572, they are signing the contract and agreeing to document all of these things and all of these changes and events that happen in our patients. Um, and all of that is with the purpose of ensuring human subject safety. So obviously we have to provide that information to any of our sponsors that are conducting the research to make sure they have, can do a, an accurate analysis of the effects of any investigational agents or products that are being used on the patient population. So we typically get our adverse events and you know, find out what's happening and what that picture is um, from a number of different routes. So we might ask the patient, have that open conversation with them. We might look at investigation results. So if that's an EKG that the patient had, if they've had an MRI, um, you know, any of other things that happen to the patient while they're in, uh, in a, for a visit. We also look at narrative notes. So any of the providers that see patients, you know, they're writing their notes to say what was discussed with the patient um, and what information was gathered from that visit. Some of our trials have diaries. So the patients are completing those between one visit and the next. Um, talking about their symptoms, maybe if they have a take home pill diary and they're adding on comments there about potential effects that they might be having. Um, so that would be another source. And then the final one there is the standard of care assessments. So things that might just happen as standard procedure for a patient that we might see in EPIC that might be relevant to report. So a lot of times, you know, for a big part of how we gather our adverse events is looking through those notes. And these are just some screenshots that I have from, um, from some of our physician notes. Um, so we typically have this review of systems section where it goes through all of the systems and it has a positive or negative, you know, so we would um, expect this patient has joint pain, but it doesn't have any rashes at this time. We often also see this um, physical, the physical exam here will have more detailed language around some of those systems. And then we also see some of the subjective, so the narrative there that's written in by that care provider that's actually physically seen and interacting with the patient. Now, some of the problems that we come across is often some of these review of systems and the physical notes don't necessarily match. So it might say everything is negative here, but then here there's a list of things that the patient has going on. Or all of these could be negative and there's nothing being identified. And then the subjective mentions things that the patient has described or expressed while they're in um, with one of the care providers. And then so we've got this one here, for example, where the patient has expressed pain. Now that would trigger, you know, when a coordinator say, okay, this patient's expressed, expressed pain while they're in for this visit. Could that be an adverse event? Now, typically to report an adverse event, we need a lot more information. So we would need to know, you know, when did it start? Is it ongoing today? Have you taken any medicine for it? How bad is the pain? What sort of grade are we looking at? So this note doesn't include anywhere near close enough the information that we need to be able to accurately document this adverse event in terms of clinical trials. We also have here, feels too weak, same sort of questions, you know, what, where are we on that weakness scale? You know, what grade are we putting that in? Is it mild, is it moderate, is it severe? And then the last one on this note that I would look at as a coordinator and think I need more information is he's sleeping much better. So that tells me at some point he was sleeping badly. So where, did we capture that? Was that a baseline? Has that started since the patient went on trial? Um, and how bad was it and how, how much better is it? Does that change that grading of, you know, it was really, really bad and now it's not quite so bad. So having those, that more information that we need to be able to document where, where exactly this patient is and what sort of adverse events this patient is experiencing. So for a long time, we have been using um, an adverse event log. So this was a paper log that we've used and in that log, we've collected those key data points that we know our sponsors typically want information for, want us to provide that information. So we're looking for an adverse event term, so pain, um, insomnia, you know, those sort of terms and phrases that we use to report the adverse event. The start and stop dates, the grade of the event, um, if it's an SAE or not, 
and the attribution of the causality. So all of those things are listed across there. Um, the essential things to tell us, you know, what, what has caused this adverse event. And then obviously we typically have, um, well, not typically, we always have our investigators because they are the ones who are delegated and responsible for determining that attribution. Um, so this is where we're talking about, was it caused by the investigational product? Was it caused by a different concomitant medication that the patient was taking? Or is it related to the disease or something else? So at the bottom of that form, we always have that line where the investigator would sign and date to indicate that they have reviewed the log, they've made the changes or added the information that's needed um, to, to document and show their oversight as the investigator. The final part there is that um, just highlight is, is that intervention and comments pet part. And we use that just to, to note on if anything further has been done about this adverse event. So, for example, if the patient has been experiencing pain, um, has the patient taken any ibuprofen to feel better? You know, is, have they taken any concomitant medication um, or was therapy held, for example? So that is just also documented on our adverse event log. So this would be something that our nurses and coordinators would complete. And then they would send it to the investigator for them to review and sign off on and agree with. So with that concomitant medications that we would include in that interventions column, we're, we're, when we're talking about concomitant medications, we're talking about any treatment that a participant takes that is in addition to the study intervention. And it could be for the same in indication as the study, or it could be for something else. And this would include any prescription medications, any over-the-counter drugs, and also any dietary supplements. So all of those things should be documented as potential comments. And again, for you know, a long time, we have used EPIC as our main tool to create that baseline idea of what the patient is on. So we've looked at the medications list. Sometimes this medication list pulls into the note. So we've got our current outpatient medications. And that, of course, you can also look at that meds tab within EPIC to see more detail um, about what, what the patient is taking. And maybe some, sometimes the indication might always also be listed there. Some of the challenges that we've come across when, with using those two different systems to manage our AEs and comments is that EPIC is sometimes incomplete, inaccurate, or inconsistent. So, you know, our, our patients might not report everything to every care provider, and they might see a nurse and then see a physician. There might be a discrepancy between what they report, uh, both for AEs and comments. Um, some of the other things that we look for and we see with regards to the ComMeds is just those start and stop dates that we don't always have um, indications. So why is the patient taking this medicine, which is something that you know, we always get asked for when we report ComMeds within the electronic data capture system to the sponsor. Um, if the visit note doesn't match other parts of EPIC, um, if other medications are missing, so over the counter medic medications, supplements or if there's something that the patient has taken from a different institution. So say they have a local, you know, a PCP that they see that prescribes them something that outside of the WVU system. We don't have a record of that. Hey Yvonne, we yeah? had um, two questions in the chat. Okay. Um, somebody had asked if uh, you were going to share your slides um, after today's presentation. And then you also had the question um, if you are conducting a study that includes a control group that is not receiving IP and there is a description in the documentation that would indicate an adverse event, is that something to report if they are not receiving IP? So that is really very protocol specific. Um, and it's it normally within the protocol language, it would say whether it's reportable. And if it's not in the protocol, it might be in the electronic data capture system. Um, they would have language around exactly what they want to have reported. Um, I know for us in oncology, our, our key part is to make sure we document everything. So we have that full picture. So we can then report everything that's necessary and know that we haven't missed anything. Um, whichever arm the patient might be on. And yes, I'm happy to share, happy to share the slides. Hey, Yvonne. Um, yeah. Sabrina, just to add to that really quick, um, on these logs that we do carry in the Cancer Center, we can attribute it. So um, we can definitely show if it's not attributed to an IP 
product, um, what we think it might be attributed to, medical history, allergies, something along that line. Thanks, Sabrina. So that will be along here. So we have these empty boxes here um, where we could add in, you know, even if the patient isn't on IP, we could add in um, if there's something they're on a control arm, so if they're on placebo, for example, um, you know, whatever it is, or you could write it in here under that other section, what exactly you think it would be attributed to. And the last one I've just got here on our challenges is um, that meds list sometimes from, you know, I think you know, everyone when they go to the doctors, the, the nurse that checks you in says, any changes in medication? Um, and, you know, patients, yes or no. Sometimes that list doesn't get updated, even if the patient says, yes, I have stopped taking this. Uh, I know myself, I, you know, have had things on that I've reported three or four times that no, I'm not taking it anymore. And it's still on there. So I know that med list is not getting updated. Um, so by drawing just straight from that med list is not necessarily giving an accurate picture of what that patient has taken on that particular day. So I'm gonna switch over now to our research note. So this is, you know, with all of those challenges, um, we were already pre-pandemic, we were already looking at a way to try and move things more electronically um, to try and streamline our process. So, you know, from that we're looking at, we had an adverse event log, which was on paper that the physician had to review and sign off. We also had a concomitant medication log that the patient, that the physician, you know, the nurse had to write off, the coordinator had to write off, and then the physician had to review and sign off. Um, so there's two things. We also have labs, which is another one, and some other things that you know, can, we've managed to incorporate within this um, single note. So prior to the pandemic, we were trying to work towards it. We were thinking about it. And then the pandemic hit and everyone was trying to be as remote as possible um, to minimize you know, people being on site and in clinic. So we definitely very rapidly moved towards, OK, let's get a note. Let's see what we can do within a research note. And Sabrina definitely spearheaded this and came up with a lot of information and um, is a wonderful person to create smart phrases within Epic. So that was what she, you know, she started with. She started creating a smart phrase that could capture all of these key elements that needed to go between the research nurse coordinator and the treating physician to see if we could do this in a much more streamlined, straightforward and quicker manner. So we came up with this research note um, and initially it was rolled out with a smaller group of physicians that are, you know, very engaged physicians that were willing to try it. Um, definitely some changes and tweaks. It came back. There were times when we had, um, you know, some patients with some physicians were using the electronic research note and other coordinators with patients with physicians were using the paper form still. So there's definitely a period of time with the crossover where we have a little bit of everything going on. Um, and we, we brought it back, we talked with our physicians to see how they felt about it, because we do need their buy-in, because we do have them co-sign this note, um, to see what we could do to simplify it, to make it better, make it more usable and manageable. And then we finally rolled out. Um, Sabrina, can you remember, remember when we rolled this out, the sort of final version that we're, we're using? I would say within the past eight to nine months. So the in last, you know, eight to nine months, we've been using this version of the note, which just still does change. And of course, changes with every protocol um, because all our protocols are different and require different things. So um, this is what we have as a, as a sort of a base template that we use for a lot of our trials. You will note this is extracted as a PDF. This is a seven page document. So this is not a small document. But again, this is for oncology where we have patients with a lot of comorbidities and they're taking a lot of extra medications and have a lot of adverse events that need to be reported. Um, you'll see that obviously it's redacted, um, so we can't see any PHI, hopefully. This is comes under when you're looking in Epic, it will come up as a research note. And once it has been co-signed, it will show up by the, as under the physician who has co-signed the note. So it looks as a physician note. Um, we always start off typically with this narrative at the beginning of the note, clearly stating what the clinical trial is and what visit it is. So for us, this is a cycle one, day one visit, um, just so it makes it very easy to track those notes. And then there's just the narrative there. There's whatever you would typically put in a note for that visit, for that patient, for that day. 
And for us, we include here language around some of our adverse events when we need descriptors to help quantify which grade the, the adverse event is. So whether it is, for example, we have here, patient has new increased creatinine, it's grade two. And, um, you know, for us on our, which we'll have a look at in, in a second, we know it's a grade two because of the value. So that's how we grade it. Um, other things we can talk about is, you know, for if the patient has diarrhea, for example, the specific language to determine what grades it would fall under. And that language should be included within this research note within this narrative section here. Um, also, we have the reference, obviously, because the physician is still doing their own note. They still have their own note that has the history and physical. Um, for us, has that um, performance status that we need and any other things, you know, talking about the treatment plan and things like that, that would go in the physician note. We have now implemented this table within this note that includes and documents all of our adverse events. So it's very similar to our log, our paper log that we had, but it is all fully electronic. And as I mentioned, this is a long document because these are all of the adverse events that this patient is experiencing. Now, at baseline, we include this log, we start this log, and we include the patient's baseline history. Um, so even though it's sort of included within this adverse event log, it, it is baseline adverse events or med past medical history um, is included in here. And that is included and documented clearly under that disease other column. So you can see here all along past medical history, past medical history. Um, related to lung cancer prior to going on trial. So I talked about our grading system that we use, um, you know, that has to be listed here. So we have our adverse event, our term, our grade, the start and stop date. These are all of our attribution columns. So for this one, we have an oral IP or an investigational product. We have um, prior systemic therapy that this patient did receive, prior chemotherapy. And then if it's disease or other, something else that might, might have a, a a relationship to whatever the adverse event is. We have action with protocol therapy. Um, and then we also have if it's an SAE or not, and our interventions and comments still. So just going back to our attributions and protocol therapy, these here have letters that we have used again for a long time within the Cancer Institute to, to simplify this so we don't have you know different things written by different positions. So we have a, a standard um, nomenclature for how we rate these so and that is included within the note so our attributions it's listed in every single note so at any point any external person coming to look at these notes knows exactly what we mean when our physicians write you are you are means unrelated if they write number one for action taken it means no action was taken here for example for increased creatinine we've got a number two delayed dose so it's really clear to anyone who comes and reads this note what happened to this patient because of this adverse event. Also related, we have, as I mentioned before, we still carry on and put in our interventions and comments and include if there's any medications there, if there's anything specific happened um, related to this adverse event that might be of use or interest to anyone reviewing this adverse event. Now I have highlighted CTCAE. Um, so this is the common terminology criteria for adverse events. Now, this is something um, that we use in oncology. Most of our protocols do refer to this guide. And this is something produced and published by the National Institutes of Health and the National Cancer Institute that could still be used by other groups. Um, and it helps categorize and um, keep things in, you know, in the right sort of system organ classes, what they call these groups, um, for when you're reporting adverse events. As you see, this is 147 pages. There's over 500 different terms in this document. Um, you know, anemia, all of these febrile neutropenia, all these different things of different types of adverse events that can be documented. Um, this is what we attempt to use, what we do use if our protocols require it. And even if they don't, we refer to this because this is what we're used to. Um, outside of this, I've um, also seen a division of AIDS. They have a table for grade and severity of adults and PDS events. And I, we did use this when we had a COVID trial. We ran a COVID trial through the CRU. Um, and this, that was the, the grading scheme that they used for that protocol. So we referred to that. And the FDA also has its own guidance for vaccine trials. So just a point of reference, and I have links to all three of these within my PowerPoint slides. So if you want to have a look at any of those. Um, that helps with having these standard terms that are used within 
um, the report and criteria for when you're looking at your adverse events. Further down here, I have had highlighted. Um, so this is really helps when talking about whether you're reporting your adverse events in verbatim terms, um, or if it's our CTCIE terms or what we would use from our CTCIE. So for us, you know, there are definitely things that happen, adverse events that happen that are not within that CTCAE guide. CAD is one of them. So that would be really called a verbatim term. Now, when it comes to this is the thing, you know, this is how we report it. We typically request that our research nurses and coordinators use the CTCAE term in their logs because we have data managers that work together with each of our research nurses and coordinators to abstract the data and submit it to the sponsor. And they might not necessarily know exactly which system organ class and what the correct um, CTCAE term is um, to report into the, the electronic data capture system. So just something to be aware of when you're including your terms there, which term you're gonna use. Across all indications, not just oncology, you know, if you're going into any other, um, any other indication, there is, most of our adverse events are categorized under that MEDRA hierarchy. So all of them start off at this lowest level term. So their example here is feeling queasy. They then go up to the preferred term, nausea, high level term, nausea and vomiting systems, high level group term. So you're getting less and less specific as you go up. And then it goes up to that system organ class, which is the same as we saw on that CTCAE. And this one would be that gastrointestinal disorders. So just being aware of that, you know, whatever you're putting in that the term column is going to get codified in some way to try and make it applicable to different scenarios and make it some, you know, something that can be used and reported by the sponsor when they come up with that potential side effects list. So as you can see, a lot of these are past medical history. So this note date was 324. So a lot of these things are prior to this first visit. Um, so we carry on all through our medical history and we have those all listed on. And then we see this is 324 is the day of that visit. So this is where we start to see more things that are relevant and could potentially be adverse events as a cause of the clinical trial. And they would be added on and edited as the patient goes through, um, through their treatment. So this was the cycle one, day one note. At cycle, say the next visit is cycle two, day one. The research coordinator would pull up this note, make any necessary edits to the adverse event column, um, and then use that going forward. If an adverse event resolves, an end date would be put in. And then on that subsequent note, that adverse event would be removed unless it popped back up again. Sabrina, is there anything you would add to that portion? I don't believe so. Okay. Thank you. So moving down to our um, comments, again, we have a really comprehensive list. Um, we have our medications listed. For us, we include this, is this a new medication? And now this is just a standard column that we use on all of our, all of our research notes. So obviously if it's a first note, it's, it's, not, it's not new for the patient because it's something they've been on. Um, we include the dose, route and frequency, the indication and the start and stop date. And I'm sure anyone who's ever entered data knows that if you don't have an indication, you're probably going to get a query. If you enter an indication that does not match and is not also listed in exactly the same language on your adverse event log, you're also going to get a query. So this helps the person writing the note to remember to tie the two in and make sure that these things match. They're in the same place. It's easy to compare um, and know that you've got that full picture. As you can see, this patient has a long list of medications. Um, at the end of that initial box, we have then check boxes that the research nurse or coordinator has to review at each note, at each visit. And it's the question, any changes to comments? So that helps the, them remember to double check, go through that list with the patient, and then add on any new medications. And that's to help, you know, make sure we don't miss anything. We end things if the patient stop taking them and we add on any new, new medications that the patient might be taking. In our note, this, this, the reason I pulled up this example was just to show that we can also include things like this. We have our investigational product log. So this is a trial that has a take-home medicine. 
Um, and this then allows our research nurse coordinator to track that accountability of, um, of the, the drugs that are taken home. Again, previously, this was a paper log that the research nurse coordinator would complete and carry with them. Now it's all in Epic and it can be pulled through from a prior note and updated as needed for each visit. One less piece of paper. And another one that we were all really super excited about is having our labs pulled through. So we have our labs pulled in. Um, and you can see we've got, you know, different highs and lows, abnormal low, abnormal labs. We've got these two in red. And right at the bottom there, we have this note. Now, I I highlighted this. Typically, it's just in red to draw attention for the physician or investigator. They are responsible for reviewing these, the adverse events that have been entered, the attributions that have been noted that should have been discussed prior to being noted, correct anything that has been documented incorrectly, and then also indicate if any of the labs that are listed here are clinically significant or if they can all be deemed not clinically significant. For us previously, we, you know, our, our physicians obviously review labs prior to any treatment. Our patients are treated safely. You know, it's part of their order that, um, you know, medicine like treatment will not start until labs have been reviewed and they've got the values that they need and they're within the safe limits of treatment to go ahead. So we know patient safety is, is in place and it's a priority. But previously we've been required to then have a physician, you know, review a piece of paper with those same labs on and then go through and indicate manually which were, significant, which were clinically significant and which weren't, sign and date when they've done that, which typically for us, I don't know if it's the same for other units, would not really be on the same day that treatment was being given. By the time they have you know, the chance to review and sign off, it might be a few days later. Then by the time it comes back to us, you know, we've got another few days later. So it's not always, and it, you know, it doesn't really add any value um, to the safety profile of review of any labs for our patients. It, really just adds on paperwork that is not not always seen as uh, um, value adding but with this we have our note as you can see here we have that audit trail of who signed it um, when it was signed when it was created and you can see that you know Carla started the note the morning of 325 made edits to it and when it was ready sent it to Dr Amalbarek and he reviewed and signed it that same day showing that he has oversight he's reviewed everything that's in there he agrees with it as it's written, uh, which should help then also make sure that he's ensuring that his note, separate note, also matches um, what, what we have here. So there shouldn't be those discrepancies on adverse events that are reported and medications. Um, Sabrina, do you, is there anything I've, I've missed or anything um, I should add in? Um, the only side note that I would make is that with these forms, um, they can be edited and stored in your in your personal smart phrase um, within Epic um, so that you don't have to retype it every single time. And you can make your edits and addendums in the smart phrase um, setting within Epic. And then when you go to act, go into your actual note, um, you can just enter your typical dot phrase of whatever you signed it as. Um, when you set up the smart phrase and pull that information in so that you don't necessarily have to have all kinds of addendums within your notes um, because you're writing it outside before you're saving that final one, keeping you from having to go back in and out of the note itself. Thanks, Sabrina. Um, and I, you just highlight again that from, from what we had off prior process to this, we've gone from having um, you know, at least three different things that the investigator had to, the nurse coordinator had to create and get to the investigator for them to review and sign to have this single document. Um, and we have had positive feedback as well from um, the COE when they came and did an audit, from our investigators, they like this note, and also from our sponsors about just being more electronic and have them, it's easier access for them to do monitoring visits um, when they can see everything within Epic. Um, so the last thing I have is, as I mentioned, the list of resources. So there, there are the CTCA versions, um, that Division of AIDS table and the FGA guidance. And there's also information there about the Metro hierarchy. So that is all I have. I don't know if there are any questions, any more comments.
Let me look in the chat for you, Yvonne. I don't see any. Um, does anybody have any questions? Well, just as a reminder, um, for the CEs, when I send those out to you, um, we're kind of at the end of the, the year. So I'm going to have to have a quick turnaround and I'll be asking you the, to get those back to me a lot quicker so than usual. Nobody else? Okay, well, I wanna thank Yvonne for um, presenting, you did a great job. And um, thank you for everyone who joined us today. I hope everybody has a great weekend.